Ayodeji Oshobi is the founder of an initiative called Stand to End Rape, predictably to keep the focus on that scourge of humanity. She was recently infected by COVID-19, and this morning she's happy to share a wonderful story about hope, as well as dispel the misconception that testing positive to COVID-19 amounts to a death sentence. Ayodeji Oshobi, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us on The Morning Show. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good. Well, um, first, let me say uh, congratulations. It's been a week since uh, you were discharged from uh, the hospital. And uh, uh, you've said on your Twitter handle that you should be called a survivor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's been hard to catch your breath. But how are you feeling now when you look back? I feel great. Uh, it's good to be back, you know, home um, to, you know, to my own comfort zone. Um, I'm, I'm very good. Um, I'm just very grateful, you know, to, to be here. And that's, that's the best part. And it's great that, you know, you've hopefully had some time to catch your breath. And yes, we do want to say again, congratulations. And we're happy that you have given us this opportunity to Help us to share your story. And let's just get straight into it and discuss your personal experience with COVID-19. Ayodeji, so much has been said, so, so many rumors, you know, people saying things like, oh, young people are less vulnerable, which may be true, but it's put some sort of image out there that young people are safe or okay, et cetera. You're 30 years old yourself, and you went through this experience. Can you walk us through your experience with COVID-19? Um, so yes, I've read, you know, so many narratives. Um, I have heard from people who say, oh, this is like an agenda from government. COVID doesn't even exist in Nigeria. And even if it exists, young people have a very strong immune system and cannot contract the disease. And I'm here to tell you it's a lie. Um, I'm 29 years old, which means I'm young. And, you know, I still got infected. And for every young person out there, I can tell a strong immune system is great, um, but it still doesn't shield you because I am healthy, I'm very strong. I mean, based on my vitals that the doctors even, you know, read, they were like, you're a very strong and, you know, healthy young person. But still, I got infected, and that's because COVID doesn't care if you're one years old or you're 20 or 50, whatever age you are, if, you know, it has access to your body, either you're not washing your hands or, you know, practicing social distancing, or maybe you just touch the surface that has, you know, ha has had droplets, you know, of it on that surface. You will contract it. It doesn't matter how old you are. I mean, in my, in my ward, there was a young baby as well who was infected, who, you know, my heart really was broken to see that a young child, you know, could also get infected. So it means that nobody's actually safe from this. Well, you came back, uh, <clears throat> having traveled for the annual Commonwealth uh, Youth Awards event, uh, which you won in uh, 2019. Now, several people were also said to have contracted uh, the virus at that particular event. Uh, when you returned, how long did it take before you started feeling the uh, symptoms? And how did you uh, react to this uh, initially? Um, so I returned um, and I started feeling, you know, somehow on the plane. I just, you know, felt like fever. Um, and I knew that something was wrong, but I thought maybe because I've had a very stressful week, because the week was really packed, um, maybe that's the reason I'm feeling this way. Maybe it's just tiredness and it's nothing. Um, so, you know, when I arrived in Lagos, um, it still felt weird. It still felt like, you know, something wasn't right. Um, but I was like, I was very careful, you know, I practice social distancing as much as I could. Um, but again, I, I didn't rule out the chances that something could be wrong and it could be COVID. Um, so, you know, when I got to the counter, um, they checked my temperature and said it was really high and asked me to step aside, which I did. Uh, but a few minutes later, you know, they came back to check and then they said it went to normal. 
So I thought, oh, maybe I was just overreacting, overthinking it. Uh, but on my way home, I, I, I started feeling the same way again. And, you know, I told my family, please don't touch me. Um, don't come close to me. I don't know what is wrong. It could, it could be malaria or anything, but I'd rather be wrong um, than actually take chances. So it was when I got back, um, I started, you know, feeling some way in my body. I had the symptoms um, and I started reaching out to... NCDC, you know, just to get tested, you know, it could, it could be malaria, you know, but I wanted to be sure um, before actually going out or even having further contact with my family members. And honestly, you did you did the right thing. You took the right approach and you did as much as you could, you know, to protect those around you, which is which is great influence to so many people out there. And thank you for sending the right message. And, you know, when you shared your story on Twitter initially, you know, you commended the health agencies for all the support that they had given you. And it, it shed such a bright light, actually, on the situation a bit more, especially because people always want to attach a negative connotation if they can find one. On to the work that is going on and what our health agencies are actually doing. But you also expressed on Twitter that you didn't initially also have the best of experiences, you know, because of the stigma as well. Some nurses maybe didn't want to come near you when you got to the hospital, etc. So can you talk us through that side of, you know, your experience as well and the pros and cons of what you went through with regards to our health agencies and officials? Um, like I did state in my Twitter um, thread, you know, um, I think I was the first female case that was confirmed, and these were female nurses, so perhaps had not handled, you know, such a situation before, um, and didn't know how to, you know, handle it when, because it was midnight um, when the ambulance came to pick me um, from my house, and I got to the isolation center, and, you know, there was nobody there to receive me. And I had to stay in the ambulance for two hours, um, if not more, you know, because, you know, no one was there at first to receive me. And then later, you know, they came forward and nobody thought to even ask how I was feeling or if I was OK, if I needed water. I mean, I also maybe uh, understand that everyone is also scared to come in contact with it and also wanted to be careful not to come too close. But, you know, I just feel like as um, health workers, human comes, you know, I mean, the disease is very important, but human also comes, you know, first, in, you know, in terms of how you handle people. Um, so I was just, you know, unpleased with how the situation was handled at first. And I could understand again, you know, everyone was trying to be careful. I just, you know, wish the process was seamless. Um, and, you know, it was a feedback I was giving to the Ministry of Health to see how they can make things work better for other people. Um, but with that being said, um, when I got into my um, ward, you know, uh, my case kind of, you know, went bad. And then the nurses, you know, became very, you know, they, they understood because I was human, you know, so they were caring, you know, some would even come in and say a word of prayer. Um, every, I was like the class captain of my world at some point because everyone knew my situation and my name and would, you know, say good morning, or how are you feeling today? So, you know, there was a relationship where we would, you know, laugh and at the times where it was really terrible, you know, they would, you know, encourage me and, you know, try to support me and hold my hands. I think one of the, maybe the nurses or the cleaners, um, one of my very bad episodes I actually threw up um, on her and I was really trying so hard not to throw up on her but you know it was really hard difficult to control my body at that time and you know she wasn't angry she didn't lash out she didn't you know like act weird rather you know she tried to help me clean up and you know took care of me which I would never forget um, so there were the you know the cons of my experience initially but I would say the pros of you know um, overweigh the cons because we kind of got into a very friendly relationship and you know they were very kind i see the nurses three times every day that's a, a whole lot to see them morning afternoon evening they were always coming to you know check our vitals to give us medication to you know give us food and the cleaners will also come as well to clean up you know it was 
It was good. Um, I, must, I must commend, you know, the nurses and the cleaners um, and the doctors as well, um, because they really made the recovery process a bit easy for me. They would tell me to look at the wall and say, listen, we know it's tough, it's hard. You know, it was very hard to even drink water. And the nurses would say, we know it's hard, just try, Oluwashiom, please try. You know, when someone is fighting for your health more than you really are, it, it, it really encourages you to, you know, also match up their energy and want to fight, which is what I did eventually. So, um, you know, it wasn't perfect from the beginning, but I am grateful for every help and every care that I got from them. Well, that's quite a touching story there. And you said you... You took about 31 tablets in a day, eight tablets in the morning, 13 tablets in the afternoon, 10 tablets uh, at night. That must have been quite, uh, quite uh, tough. But, I mean, you've talked about the positive sides of the uh, isolation centers in terms of the dedication of the staff and other workers who were there. But were there moments when you were disappointed? And looking back now, are there things that you think that the uh, managers of the isolation center who work upon and try to improve upon, either in terms of care or in terms of the maintenance of the environment or whatever else you may have observed? Every system has its own lapses. Um, every system you know, is working through the, the situation. Even the most advanced countries with the best health care are only also struggling through this process. Um, so yes, there were moments that were not perfect, um, but. At the end of the day, it's a learning curve for them. Um, and I did my best, you know, to give feedback to them on a daily basis on what could be improved, what could change, and, you know, the kind of diets that should be introduced. And, you know, they, they, they did make efforts, um, you know, to make those amends. You know, it, it may not have come instantly. But, I mean, as, as days went by, they were able to, like, infuse some of the feedback I gave them into the services they were providing. Um, and so, again, all I can advise is, you know, better diets for people in there. I mean, they fed us. <laughs> they fed us. We were fed up. Like, the food was so good. Um, but, you know, we could always make things better in terms of balancing the nutrients and all of that. So I didn't give that feedback. And, you know, they did work on it um, also in terms of the um, facility, you know, the, the sanitary part of it you know, can also be improved on um, the entertainment part as well, um, because there was a part where, you know, I was the only one in the world and there was nobody to talk to. There was nothing to watch. Um, and, you know, I was sort of bored and lonely. So I did tell them, like, you know, it'd be good to have entertainment here or something. And, you know, days after that came, it wasn't immediate, um, but it, it did come. So, you know, um, I don't want to shed more light on the cons. I would rather, you know, shed more light on the pros so that we can encourage our healthcare system and our healthcare workers to, you know, improve on what they're already doing um, and so that they feel appreciated. Certainly. And it's so amazing to hear that you were able to give so much feedback and they received that feedback really well. I mean, I remember one of the pictures that you posted on Twitter with like four different meals that you had and everyone was like, OK, wow, at least you're getting some really nice food <laughs> in there. So it's good that, you know, <laughs> it's good that they listened to you and took that what feedback. To what I got mm. Sorry to cut you. No, go, go for it. Yeah, like those meals, like when I was alone, Jeez, I literally was begging them, please don't bring me food anymore. It's too much. <laughs> I literally was pleading because it was a lot. So like they'll give you two like two um croissants, um, give you two boiled eggs, give you um two com like two wraps um sachet conflicts, give you oatmeal, and still give you some other things just for breakfast. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 and save money. I said, please don't serve me this much. Save the money. There are more people, you know, likely to come after me. Let's have enough to go around. So yes, they fed us well. Well, you know, that's that's the kind of amazing spirit that you give off in terms of humanity. And that brings me to the question I wanted to ask you, because you also run an organization, Stand to End Rape, and STIR has become one of the most prominent organizations for survivors of rape across Nigeria and beyond Nigeria today. Now, during a time like this, so many women, or even men as well, are unfortunately 
quarantined with their abusers. And I know that there are organizations out there that are trying to make efforts to relieve these people of that experience. Is STIR currently doing anything in that regard? Um, yes, uh, it's really a sad moment for us um, because for us, we know that sometimes work is like a coping and also an escape mechanism for you know people to survive, to be away from their abusers. But with this situation now, people are confined within the same space with their abusers. And you know, there was a there was a day that in one day we received over 25 calls of people who were calling about domestic violence or rape during this time. Um, and you know, STAIR is definitely one of the organizations providing support services to those who are experiencing this violence. But again, it brings us to the, to the conversation about the lapses in our response system. We don't have enough shelters to take these people. We even have a lockdown, you know, so we need shelters that have vehicles to go and pick them from their homes and put them in safe spaces. And we don't have enough in Lagos. Um, I've heard women who maybe, you know, give money to their partners every day, but now that they are at home and they have no jobs and, you know, no, no sort of income, their partners have become extremely violent. So for you to even help them is you giving them money. And then you can't give such a woman money to give her abuser. And if you want to take such women out of those spaces, you also need to consider their children because they have people that they care for and they would not want to leave those homes without their, children's, um, their children rather living with them. So it's, it's a very tough situation that we are in, but as an organization working with also different partners, we're trying as much as we can um, to provide support, either mentally, um, psychologically, um, um, you know, in terms of physical space, um, legally, you know, to this woman. But it's a tough um, situation, I must tell you, because most organizations right, right now are actually working from home. And, you know, I just heard good news this morning that, you know, GBV services has been included as, you know, um, primary services um, that people can actually work from their um, offices now. So that's a good news for us, which means we can work. But also we need protective equipment, you know, um, having in, to come in contact with people, having to talk to them. It's very up close and personal. And we also need to be able to protect ourselves and our staff so that we don't put, you know, um, the clients at risk. And we also, as service providers, are not at risk. But again, anyone who needs help can definitely reach out to us. The Lagos State Government put out like a graphics with different organizations and their contact numbers. And we can be contacted at any time. Well, I ordered you, we need to take a short break now, but don't go away. We'll be right back with you in a matter of uh, minutes. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News Channel. Still with us uh, is Ayodiji Oshowobi, founder of the Stand to End Rape Initiative and a gender equity advocate. Uh, Ayodiji Oshowobi, thank you for uh, staying with us. Uh, you have talked about a, a number of things, but I would like to ask you one subject that you also referred to on uh, Twitter, uh, which is stigmatization. Now, what, what has been your experience in this regard before, during, and after your COVID-19 uh, experience? And if you've uh, 
face stigmatization? How have you been trying to deal with that? I'll move on. Ah, oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, like I said, I was picked up from my parents' home because when I returned, my my you know relatives picked me, and I was in our, my parents' house. And when I was picked up, you know, I got news um, that certain people in my parents' you know um, area started acting a kind of way towards my parents, and you know, trying to distance themselves from them, even though they were. They were free. They didn't have anything. But the idea that, oh, their daughter has something and she was in the same house with them, you know, got them to start acting somewhere. And it did hurt me because, you know, I'm here trying to fight for my life, but I'm not also comfortable with my parents facing stigmatization on the outside. So it was important for me to, you know, um, come forward to speak about my experience to educate people and enlighten them on the reason, you know, not to stigmatize those who are positive because it's not a death sentence and it's not something you wish on yourself. And, you know, even when I came out, a couple of people reached out to say, oh, I heard this story. I'm not I don't think it's true. Um, but because it's you, I'll give you the benefit of doubt. Is it true? And I asked them, why would you think I will come forward to lie? It's not, it's not a great news that I want to lie about, but I'm happy, you know, the great news for me is that I beat it, regardless of what you think. And they're like, oh, wow. I used to think it was just like a propaganda by governments to embezzle funds and to get donations from people. So I've had people, you know, someone even tweeted yesterday and, and said, oh, it's, you know, people who say they tested positive to COVID-19. It's definitely a lie. It's not in Nigeria. Um, you know, people are just trying to get attention from government or government is trying to use this to get money. And the truth of the matter is, we can't do this. We can't stigmatize people. Because what that would do is you're going to make people or force people or encourage actually people to lie about their health and their travel history. And I've seen a couple of comments on Twitter where I've heard that patients actually lied about their travel history because they're trying to make it seem like it's just malaria and not COVID. And that's what stigmatization would do to all of us. It's going to cause a problem where we will not just be doing and would actually be doing more harm than good because those who have it would be very concerned about their health. And I've read cases where people who are positive are being lynched, um, though not in Nigeria, but outside Nigeria. But that's even a, a concern for me. If people say they tested positive and we lynch them, that's a worry for those who actually would, be, would have the symptom but would not want to say anything, would want to manage it by themselves. And trust me, if we allow that to happen, this is going to spread across because their caregivers in their homes would not know what is wrong. They will think it's just malaria or it's just fever and would have close contact with them and they will contract it. And then they would you know, spread it to anyone within the household because people still don't understand the concept of don't shake. We're still doing social distancing, but people are still partying. People are still converging for church programs, for, for mosque programs, for different social gatherings. So we are going to spread this thing, and this is what stigmatization is going to cause. But if we're able to encourage people who test positive, you know, to get help, send them your love, send them your strength, help them fight this, we are reducing the possibility of someone else contracting because they can openly come forward to talk about their experience, to get help, and, you know, hopefully be negative, which is what we pray for. Absolutely, that is what we pray for. And, you know, I'm glad that we're on this topic because it's it's a very interesting one. I mean, do you think, having survived COVID-19, looking around you, I mean, Lagos is now on lockdown with a couple other states as well. The governments have gone back and forth a bit as well on the lockdown rules. Do you think that people are now taking this virus, COVID-19, this pandemic, a bit more seriously? Or do you still have worries? I mean, for example, over the weekend, we saw actress from Kerkinde throwing a house party and I mean she came out with an apology video that hardly anyone really believed and then we heard that she got arrested etc how do these things make you feel as someone that had to go through that experience as a country we really need to be responsible um, I mean government has to be responsible for our well-being but we also need to be responsible for ourselves because like they say, the first point of security is you, yourself, your decision, your action, and your inaction as well. We determine if you're safe or you're going to put yourself at risk and also other people. And, you know, since coming forward, 
I've had, you know, people question, you know, is it true and all of that. But I've also had people who have said, oh, wow, if not for your story, I wouldn't have believed it. But now that it's you and you're a credible source, I believe that this thing is for real and I'm going to be very cautious yeah. going forward. And that's a good news for me. That's a good thing I want to read. Yes, they doubted the story, which, you know, people have doubts. It's okay. But the most important thing is when you're confronted with, you know, credible information, that you actually take precautions and, and you know, take one, one message or two from that. And so when I see people who are still partying or still going out and still converging for whatever reason it may be, for weddings or whatever, I'm just saying in my mind, like, listen, this is not something I wish on anyone, not even my enemy or someone I don't like. I don't wish it for anybody. Uh, because it's not an experience I really enjoyed. Uh, I didn't enjoy it at all. I was in pain and all of that. Um, but most importantly is the fact that if I did not make that conscious decision, even not knowing that at the time that I had COVID, if I didn't take that conscious decision to, you know, so, uh, to self-isolate, I would have put my family and even people in my family's compound at great risk because everyone was very happy about, you know, me going to lead the procession of the queen. So they wanted to come and say hello, to greet me, to congratulate me and all of that. Friends wanted to take me out for dinner. I had many interviews lined up, you know, to share my experience and how it was. But I had to turn all of these things down. Painfully, yes. But it's a very conscious decision I had to make to ensure that I'm not putting someone else at risk if I indeed had um, COVID-19. So it's it's really disappointing to see people not take it seriously. Um, but I hope that as, as, as the media, as individuals who have experienced this or, you know, as, as people who are more enlightened, we would intensify our efforts to educate people, to help them see that, listen, it's not, you know, a lie like you may want to believe. It's not a government propaganda like you may want to believe. It's real. People are fighting. People are battling. We've recorded deaths in Nigeria, which I'm really sad about, but we've also re recorded recoveries, which I'm really excited about, and condolences to the families that lost their loved ones. It's not a good experience to have. So I hope that Nigerians, you know, will take this seriously, will sit in their homes and only step out for essential services. And even when they oh, do, they also you. practice social distancing thank and you. also wear their protective gears as much as Absolutely. they can. Well, thank you very much, Ayodhi Joshuaobi, uh, on that point about people practicing social distancing. We thank you very much for joining us this morning on The Morning Show. And all the best with the rest of your day and endeavors.